last speaker before lunch, Dr. Scientist Hero. Jeff Ling did not think about the brain in abstract terms. Having watched young men and women die, he has dedicated his career to understanding how battlefield explosions cause brain injury and how to improve recovery. He spent two tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. And in addition to his role at several startup biotech companies, Dr. Ling is a professor of neurology and attending neurocritical care physician at Johns Hopkins and founder of the Center for Military Clinical Neurosciences at the US UHS. Ling also founded the biotechnologies office at DARPA and was one of the architects of the Obama Brain Initiative. Please welcome all around badass Jeff Ling. Thank you very much. I do not have a large series of slides. I think you'd be glad to hear that. Actually, I just have this one. And really, the question that, uh, that I wanted to answer or help answer is this idea of saying yes. Yes to the organizers of the Brain Mind Conference. Yes. Right. And, the, and what they're trying to do, let's think about what they're trying to do. They're trying to create an opportunity space for the wonderful scientists of which we've been hearing about at this conference and the previous at Stanford and potentially at the next one, as well as into the um, investment community. To bring together two communities that traditionally have been a little bit far apart for a number of reasons. But how do we say yes to them to bring these two communities closer together so that there can be some meaningful interactions and there can be some actually some investments into some of these wonderful things that we've been hearing to move it into the space that many of us live in, which is trying to improve the human condition. How do we say yes? And I would argue that there is an opportunity space right now in this time that there is an opportunity to help facilitate that through a new federal agency. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that in short order. But right now, we do face a very obvious crisis. And the science, the only way we're going to get out of it is to science the heck out of it. There are 7,000 known diseases, 7,000. There's only 500 known treatable, of those sort of treatable. Only 500 are treatable. 7,000 known diseases, only 500 are treatable. Think about that just for a minute. It's not for lack of investment. It's not for lack of intellectual effort. The problem, I think, is exactly what's being articulated by the founders of this conference is somehow we can't get that wonderful solutions out of the laboratory. All the things you've been hearing about today have got to get out of the lab. Right now, they're in the lab. And they need to get out of the lab and into the hospitals. And it's as simple as that. So how do we do that? How do we create that yes opportunity? So let me digress for a minute and talk about another place for which there was this same kind of urgency. And that was in 1957. 1957, Sputnik went up. The US got beat. Hands down, the US got beat. How did they get beat? By the Russians. Russians' economy is one-tenth the United States. They had nowhere near the scientific capacity that the United States had, and yet they got beat. And they got beat for a number of reasons, but President Eisenhower felt that at that time, remarkably, that he thought that the thought process, both on the government side and on the academic side, had become staid and bureaucratic. So he wanted to change that. And he changed that by launching an agency to cross the divide. And it was, of course, called DARPA, the Advanced Research Project Agency for Defense, DARPA. And over that period of time, the DARPA process, which was different at that time, and I would argue is still different to this day, had remarkable successes. We can enumerate them, but I won't. But at the same time, I want to point this out. They had remarkable failures, dramatic failures. In fact, they had more failures than they had successes. But in their failures, they learned something. We all learn from our failures, number one. Number two is they didn't fail because they didn't try. That was one thing they did not do. They always tried. But in their failures, they learned something which they were able to build upon. And honestly, if you're not failing, you're not pushing. Correct? So in this, I would argue that the timing is appropriate for a DARPA-like 
federal agency. And I've been working hard on this. This is not something I'm just speculatively talking about. I've been working really hard on this. And I'm happy to say that the Advanced Research Project Agency for Health, which I called HARPA, is in fact been given the green light by the Secretary of Health and Human Services to do a pilot demonstration to prove to him that this would work. So this is not some pie in the sky thing to some knuckleheaded old retired army colonels coming about. I really truly believe this because what does DARPA do and what would HARPA do? It would be a source of non-dilutive, for the investors up here, the non-dilutive capital from the government to cross that high risk divide that is known as the valley of death. With a remarkable, wonderful science that comes up to a certain point, it is ready to go into advanced translational research and development opportunity spaces, but yet the risk is still high. You heard a lot of wonderful talks today, and I did too. I listened to them all. They're great. But what did you not hear? You did not hear what is the MVP, the minimally viable product. You did not hear what is the use case. You did not hear what risk level they thought they were at. These are the people who know the work better than anybody else. And yet you, the investors sitting here, have not read all the papers, do not know what's the risk. What's my return on investment? When am I going to see my cash back? Because it's not just your money, it is your investment group's money. You didn't hear any of that. At the same time, we have to find a way, recognizing this, that there's somebody who has to ask those questions and be ready to back it up to cross that divide. There has to be an investment group on one side saying, you need to give me this. And the scientists say, I can give you that and marry the two. DARPA does that beautifully. I was at the agency for 13 years. It does it beautifully. But it doesn't do it for health in a large way. It does do it for health in some. We all know that. Dr. Church knows that. Dr. Boynton knows that. A number of the folks in here know that because they get some DARPA funding. But that's not DARPA's prime mission. DARPA's prime mission is to safeguard the United States of America against cyber attack, against nuclear attack, and all that other nasty stuff. And they do a good job at it. They do a really good job at it. Health is one small element of it. But health, we know, is so big that it deserves its own place. Correct? HHS is a $1.145 trillion agency. That's a T word, folks. That's a T word. And you would say, oh, that's almost as big as defense. No, the Department of Defense is $700 billion. Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid Services spend $600 billion a year. Almost the same as the entire Department of Defense goes to CMS. The entire Department of Defense goes just to Medicare and Medicaid services. That's how important health is to us. And yet, HHS does not have a DARPA. Why not? We have an NIH. NIH is awesome. I love the NIH folks. But they are not in the business of dating that, crossing that divide. They're not. And it's OK. They're doing what they need to do, which build foundational knowledge to create that basic foundation that we need to build on. But we need something to pull it across the finish line. And so my, in my opinion, what we need is we need to have an agency who's devoted to doing just that, to making a clear change in clinical practice. The goal should be, does whatever we're doing make a clear change in clinical practice? If it doesn't, it doesn't belong at HARPA. It belongs at NIH. But once it does, it needs to have an investment community in collaboration, in collaboration, where the non-dilutive money can take it past that early risk phase so the investment community can pull it back. But the investment community has to come forward and talk to the scientists in a forum that allows them to say, what is the MVP? What is my ROI? What is my timeline? And blah, 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 blah. In my mind, if you look at the Hallmark Catechism, as Tom had put up on the board before, it's worth looking at. It's how we lived at DARPA. And I'll just summarize it very simple. One is, what are you trying to do? If you're trying to cure cancer, which cancer? Thyroid cancer. Which thyroid cancer? Follicular thyroid cancer. Good. Now I know what you're trying to do. right? To understand the brain, that's a big thing. But if I'm trying to go after reactive depression, I can get that. If I'm going after multi-system atrophy from Parkinsonism, I get that. I get that. 
Second, how are they doing it today? Where's my start of my journey? They're doing it today, blah. What do I hope to achieve? I hope to achieve the therapy from MSA, from Parkinsonianism. Got it. So now let's draw out that path from point A to Z. We can timeline it. We can try to figure out how much money it's going to be. We can actually assess the risk. Because I tell you, when you talk about risk, the scientists have a risk called scientific risk. The investors have a risk called going to go broke. All right? And that is something that has to be recognized from the scientist side as well as understood from the investor side. But there is a place in my mind for non-dilutive government funding to help bridge that divide. For that reason, I pushed very hard with a good friend of mine, Dr. I'm not one, Mr. Ra uh, Bob Wright. And Mr. Bob Wright has been actually the winds behind the sails of this. I couldn't do this alone. So Bob Wright sadly lost his wife to pancreatic cancer. Sadly. Who is Bob Wright, you would ask? He was the former CEO of NBC. And he was the former vice chair of GE. Bob Wright launched The Apprentice. Bob lost his wife tragically to pancreatic cancer. And in spite of his wealth, in spite of his connections, there was nothing that could be done for his wife. He also has a son, a grandson, who suffers from autism. And he founded Autism Speaks. With his help, we in fact are launching Harpa. That is how I've been able to get through to the administration. And I've worked hard. I've got the support of Dr. Girard, the Assistant Secretary of Health. Dr. Cadillac, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Readiness. And by combining the two of them with this, we've gotten the Secretary Azar, we have brief Vice President Pence, and I do have a draft executive order to launch HARPA on President Trump's desk. And so in the end of the day, we are close. But in my mind, there's no time like now than to have a HARPA. Thank you. <laughs>